Greeting Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that we love all things Apollo, and that during our last visit to Steve Gervetson's amazing space collection, we were given the opportunity to take two holy boxes of Apollo electronics to our lab. These are the boxes that brought you voice, data and live TV from the moon, and should be early masterpieces of microwave electronics, the blackest of black arts in analog electronics. Our spacecraft transponder is now fully up and running and we have turned our attention to the ground part of the link. We've approached it three ways, with professional Keysight test equipment, which got us there the quickest by far, with software-defined radio, flexible and affordable, but also a complex programming endeavor for which we needed the help of experts. But eventually, we'd like to do it with the original NASA test equipment. And lucky us, we've got the NASA receiver from Steve Gervetson. Even better, we recently got our hands on the gorgeous golden transmitter we were missing, thanks to a generous collector who prefers to remain anonymous. In previous episodes, we got both of them working, but there is a giant wrinkle. It appears that in the intervening years since the Apollo missions, they have been modified, and no longer work on Apollo's frequencies. For Apollo, we need to transmit at 2.1064 GHz and receive the transponder return frequency in the ratio of 240 over 221, which gives 2.2875 GHz. But we discovered that our NASA receiver is tuned to 2.247 GHz. We checked that frequency and it's not Skylab, it's not the ATP mission, not the shuttle, and not the ISS, which, by the way, still uses the Apollo original frequencies. It can be any of the deep space probes either, because they are all assigned to the higher part of the S-band. So it's an Earth orbit satellite of some kind. The A program that shows on our handwritten notes might refer to the A series of satellites, which stands for the Atmospheric Explorers. But I could not find their frequencies and don't even know if they were using S-band. However, we found one perfect candidate, the GEOS-3 satellite, which was launched in the same time frame as the A spacecraft. GEO-3 was an Earth and ocean studying satellite launched in 1975. It measured the Earth's precise shape and its gravitational field, as well as the true height of oceans. And it was also involved in some advanced S-band tracking experiments. Aha! Uh -huh. And its S-band transponder has the exact same block diagram as our Apollo transponder. They are identical. Moreover, the frequency used by the GEO-3 downlink is 2.247, an exact match to our receiver. Since the transponder uses the 240 over 221 frequency ratio for the receive to transmit, it would have needed a transmitter at 2.069112 GHz. And guess what we found when we turned on our golden transmitter? It transmitted at 2.069118 GHz. Give or take 6 Hz, that confirmed that both the transmitter and receiver we have were from the same match test setup, and might have been specifically retuned for the GEO-3 satellite. So you'd think it would be a piece of cake to change the quartz crystals and get both of them back to their original Apollo frequencies. But it's not as simple as it looks. Both use lower frequency VCOs in the 20 MHz range that then get multiplied up to their S-band frequencies. And these VCOs have a very specific and narrow tuning profile of only a kilohertz or so. We spent quality time in previous episodes to try to find what exact crystals were needed. You previously learned from the channel that there is much more to a crystal than just its frequency marking. After much effort, we figured out that they were third harmonic parallel resonance crystals, the receive one was built for 15 picofarad load and the transmit one for 30 picofarad load. Both needed to be specified down to the hertz. 
We finally found a company that could make us some custom replacement crystals. They are called Laptec Precision from Canada. So with some trepidation, we placed our order and waited for the custom polished crystals to be fabricated, hoping that we had indeed ordered the right thing. So Mike, yeah, we're back. We have crystals. We do. And one is the original. Yeah, this guy's the original crystal. This is the one that we just had made. For the uh, incredible price of 50 bucks a piece, which is remarkable. Yeah, for a 23.307292 yeah, meter. <laughs> they hit it 1.8 ppm. Uh, so hopefully we've ordered the right thing. Yeah, we have the goods. Now, we don't expect that we can just pop them in there and that the receiver or the transmitter would magically work at their new frequency. No, 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 you have to retune the VCO, the amplifiers and the multipliers before it works again. And there are 12 visible adjustments on top of this VCO and four more below. The transmitter is even worse with about 25 adjustments. What do they all do? So for a while we thought we'd have to reverse engineer the whole circuit first. But then we caught a huge break when Mike found the manual for our receiver on the back shelf at our anonymous collector's place. Best of all, he gave it to us right there and then. Here it is in the plane while we are flying back. And in there were not only the full schematics, but also the complete procedure for retuning the whole thing. Hallelujah indeed. Suddenly our high-risk reverse engineering mission became a case of following the instructions. No such luck for the transmitter though, so we'll still have to guess out what the 25 adjustments do all by ourselves. So since we had to take the crystal out of the VCO and then we'll have to realign the VCO anyhow, we took it out on the bench, which reveals this great assembly here. And that's the 23 megahertz and uh, by six multiplier, which is uh, by two and by three. So that's made with little transistors. And there's the by 16 multiplier. And we opened it up. Actually, Mike opened it up. Mike was a curious one. So yeah. I wanted to know what's inside. I saw a really weird symbol on the schematics and didn't. Yes, <laughs> yes, I have. And so I expected um, a step recovery diode, which we see over here and I expected the, the the village phase matching thingy here which only RF engineers can calculate but I didn't expect that filter on, on the output so that's the filter that selects just the 16th harmonic and that this is just pure RF magic so you can see the, the step recovery diode is here it generates a very abrupt step full of harmonics and that goes into this which is an antenna to ground and then it has three cavities and obviously the, the RF waves mix it through here and then it has an antenna in the last cavity and it comes out and then <laughs> we're wondering how those resonant cavities work and you, you tune them obviously and I think but I am no RF engineer. I think this is a quarter wave uh, stub. And uh, it's about the right length for a quarter wave at 2 gigahertz. Uh, and quarter waves things have magic properties. Uh, we, we so it's a resonant cavity of some sort. I have no idea how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am mesmerized by uh, no true microwave engineering. After having asked a real microwave engineer, it looks like the three stubs are actually three quarter wave antennas which will resonate and radiate the signal through at only the frequency the antenna is resonant at. Or so we think. Okay, we think we understand vaguely how this works. Time to do the crystal exchange. Strangely, there was no socket. We think it had been removed during the previous modification. So we had to solder it in. Yeah. Alright, that's centered. Centered. I guess that's it. I just powered up. Make a test condition shown in figure 550. 
uh, frequency counter, we have it. Uh, voltmeter, DC voltmeter, we have it. That's for the bias. Supply, we have it. The 10 kilo ohm pot, it's wired in this little blue pot over there. Check, 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 check. We have to do 9 volts somewhere. So 9 volt on the pot and 0 volts uh, input to the VCO. So let's do that. And then connect the counter to 23 megahertz test connector, which I've already done. Adjust L5. So basically you put the VCO right in the middle with the DC bias. And then you make sure it's within 100 hertz of where it should be. L5 is that guy. Uh, so actually, eh, eh, uh, we should get the little wrench to get that one off, all right? Okay, the patient's on the right. Output of the 23 megahertz oscillator, frequency of the 23 megahertz oscillator. This is our tuning voltage. So that should be plus minus 15, I already adjusted them. Plus and minus 15. Ooh, I don't see any oscillation. Okay, after a little fright, we got our act together again. I was not grounded at the right place when I measured the uh, the pot, and I think that screwed up the voltages in the VCO. And now we are 23.3056. That sounds close. It's pretty close. All right, and we need to be at... Uh, 307292. So it's very fine, right? Oh, we, yeah. We are... Th this is... This is Hertz right here. So you're already good, right? This is. Yeah, you're using 10 Hertz. If you can make it perfect, if you want. Oh, excellent. Okay, so we did the first part right. We have the right crystal. It's mm -hmm. not the right frequency again. Yay! And <laughs> by the way, my shoulder tool, because it's, it's a weird. It's a weird. Um, stem that they have and we were trying to figure out something that would turn it and we found out the the wire wrapping tool was the best. Yeah, it has yeah. this little, little bridge inside. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a... it's weird. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the inverse of what you expect it's instead of instead of being a groove, it's a mm -hmm. tongue. Right. right. Okay. It's drifting a lot. Did they say how long it had to be on? Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe you have to turn it on for a little while. So there's a note here in the operations section to allow two hours of warm-up before using it for any measurements. Okay, that might be our problem. But I guess we should wait and wait that it stabilizes and do something else. Yeah, just let it sit a little bit. Help Ken that's struggling with his command boxes. Command box commanding? I'm putting it back together. All right. Help Ken distract Ken, one of the yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours later. Oh, magic. 7292. Okay. We're tuned to perfection. So that was a big one, making sure we could hit the center frequency. Then there were a lot of amplitude peaking adjustments, which were pretty boring. You just adjust one pot after another, each time maximizing the output. We soon made it to the end of the time 6 multiplier, where you're supposed to have a really high output power before you send it to the very lossy by 16 multiplier. And plenty of power we had, 16 dBm. But we hit a documentation snag. There was an error in the procedure. So, we have to adjust the output for maximum output, so you want as much peak going into your your, your multiplier, uh, the step diode at the end, so that makes sense. And they want 140 milli s seconds, which makes no sense. And so is it millivolt because it goes into a, a, a millivolt meter, and that would be just zero power. That would be minus three dB power. So that's mm -hmm. not it. So we think it's 140 milliwatts, which would be 21 dBm, which makes sense. We have 16 dBm right now out of the output. And then Mike, you had another insight. S is right below W on the keyboard, so. Yeah, so it might be sl slippery finger. Yeah. All right, so we'll assume this is 140 milliwatt. That makes sense. So after tweaking the three adjustments, we got close to 20 dBm, not 
quite 140 milliwatt, but we think all they want is to adjust the max without exceeding 140 milliwatts. So here's the results with the direct path again, and I think we can just start to see the third order products down there, and we have about 30 dB. And as the output of the time 6 multiplier, and it's working great, 99% of the power is at the multiplied frequency, the filter between the two multipliers will get rid of the rest. So now comes the front part of the VCU, we're going to try to make it tune the right amount. And this is the money part, where we get to tune the VCO by changing its control voltage. It will really tell us if we order the right crystal or not. We need to get to 600 Hz per volt of tuning. I want to go to 1 volt yeah. over here. And then I tune it for 600. And you tune it for 600. Okay. okay. Oh, we are close. We are at 500. And yes, looks like we did it right. It tunes as it should. Now we are one step away. Can we get a microwave signal out of the final multiplier with its magic cavities? We're supposed to get 0 dBm or 1 milliwatt of microwave frequency. If we do, we have probably succeeded. Okay, we brought out the um, 22 gigahertz spectrum analyzer that we use it at 2.1. We should be minus 10 and we're minus 20, 30, 40, 50. So we have to tune the magic cavity. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, its ca and its capacitor. <laughs> and see if we can bring it back to minus 10 dBm. If not, we are in not working. Yep. So that's a bit scary. We have some output at 2.1 GHz, but hardly any. Minus 50 dBm is 10,000 times too small. The microwave multiplier is just not working at all, not even close. Can we gain a factor 10,000 by just tweaking it? Yeah, so th this I would assume didn't change because that's a matching to the step recovery diode. Okay. So. But since we change the frequency, the resonant cavity should be fairly off. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Yes, oh yes. It's coming. Ah, oh, there we go. Whoops. Oh boy. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, that's because maybe I, I need more isolation. So we, we have to keep the spurs away. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's up to us, I think. You are pretty close. You're so that, that's only one of them. So yeah. that's the middle one. But they were very far out of tune. Yes, you're climbing. And I'm starting to bring up the Yeah, 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 and it's going down. Okay, yeah. Okay, and so you can let the spurs climb one, two, three, four, up to here. Up to one, two, three. Or five up to that line down here. Okay. Uh, you you are you are within one dB of this of the top spec, right? So, and and we probably have one dB of loss in the cable, or whatever. Right? So we, we have it. Yes, success. The magic screws in the magic RF cavities did their job, and Mike climbed all the way up without the thing going into self oscillation. We did it, we're back in spec. Now the test of truth, see if we got the correct Apollo frequency. Taking into account a 50 MHz shift for our intermediate frequency, our VCO should end up at 2.2375 GHz. 2.2375? Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we're back. Apollo frequency, my friend. Alright. That's it. We got it. Hooray, success back on our feet, but that is only half the battle. We've got to do the golden transmitter now. One week later. Okay, so Mike is about to change the crystal in the transmitter. We had done and retuned the transceiver, which was easier because we, <laughs> had... we have the instructions. Oh, yes, we can <laughs> so this one we don't. So no manual, but we had characterized the transmitter thoroughly in a previous episode and the adjustment procedure should be similar to the receiver. We got a big scare though at the beginning, as we had no oscillation with the new crystal. And that's the new crystal in? Yep.
and nothing. It does not oscillate. Nothing here. Nothing there. So, if we believe it's the same as the other one, here are the one around the oscillator, and these are the one are, that are the amplifier. So yeah. So is it so far off frequency that they have changed something inside? 21.5, 29 oh, 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 you got it! I got some life. Okay. On, on 18? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, I, oh, I, you, you got it. Okay, so now you got you got to tune the amplification. The, uh, 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 I would say that downstream, yeah. So you maximize. There we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whew, I was worried for a second. It's 20.46, so we are the wrong frequency somehow? That's probably gonna... We are the wrong frequency, we are 20.46. How can that be? And we should be at 21.94, right? Let's see, I'm changing the frequency with this capacitor. Yeah, but you're 1 mega, no, 500. One, oh, I lost it. Oh, that's better, that's the right frequency though. Oh, nice, okay. So go optimize your. Um, what what did you change to get there? Uh, the capacitor here. Okay, so now it says twenty one point nine four. Okay, well, it's it's at the right. I can see it over there. Twenty one point nine four. So you're good at. Woo! So okay, that got me worried for a second. Okay, so now you just tune the amplifier for it. There you go. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's very touchy. So you made one adjustment that. Change the center frequency, which we need to hit, by the way. Oh, that one changes the center frequency. This one. Okay. Which one is that? Uh, this is L18. Okay. You want to get it to 941732. Woohoo! Okay. Once we got the oscillation going at the right frequency, we were pretty much out of the woods as we could tell which adjustment did what by just trial and error. We made it all the way to the dreaded tunnel diode multiplier, this time a times 24, and I was afraid it would be very far off like the receiver was. But not here, it actually looked already optimized for the Apollo frequency. It almost looks like they didn't retune the multiplier when they changed the frequency. It kind of looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah. That we already peaked at it. And they got less power, but enough, so they didn't really care. Right. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, the multiplier was already uh, at, at, its, um, at its Apollo frequency. Amazing. Yeah, they didn't, bo they didn't change it. Woohee! Okay, so we are done except for the modulator, which they might not have changed either. <laughs> I kind of feel like I probably didn't. And that, I have no idea what the knobs are doing, but these are only two. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so I think we can figure that one out. <laughs> I hope so. For the modulation, we reproduced the sideband pattern we had seen with the modern keysight analyzer in the last episode which had conveniently calculated for us what it should be for the correct modulation. At 2 hits, 11.6, and we are 11.5. I think we did it, Mike. We did it. Without any manual. Yeah, without the manual. <laughs> who, who needs manual? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I think we can transmit and receive yeah. with, our, with all our equipment. We got it back. One hour later. Okay, we have uh, wheeled back our retune transmitter and receiver. So this one we retune the VCO, so it should receive at the proper frequency, we hope. Takes a few seconds for it to come up, all right. Uh, this one we just retune an air go, and we know it transmits on the right frequency. And on the right, is our Apollo transceiver transponder with a transmit and a receive antenna both connected and it's ready to go. I have AC power. 
Off we go. So I'm going to turn the transceiver on first, one of the two. And you see it at uh, its free running frequency. So if you look down there at the receive signal, it's of course at zero because we're transmitting nothing. Turn it on. If it turns on, our switch is still not liking me all the time. There we go. But it's not locked, so I need to sweep the frequency a little bit. Let's see if it gets it. There you go. Up. Oh, I got it. I'm locked. So let's now take the receiver, close the loop, and I can see the receiver is receiving it. It's already working. It's uh, plus 40 kilohertz off. So I tune it towards the, the center and there you go, now it, it, it's, it's locked. So we have both the receiver and the transmitter uh, locked to the transponder. And we have a double locked Apollo link, uh, which is kind of a big milestone for us. This is about uh, nine months of work. When we saw both sides lock, we had a, a, a little victory dance here, so important point. So that's it, we have a lot of green lights here. Solid receive frequency and everything is locked. All the lights are green and we are at the right Apollo frequency. So on this good news, I'll see you in the next episode.